Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I've uh, really enjoyed listening into the discussions and debates uh, this morning. And what I want to do is to take us on a, a further journey. I want to stretch our thinking in some uh, additional directions regarding the future of your business. And uh, I work with uh, many of the largest telcos, uh, largest banks, largest IT companies. So I could be with Google one day, Microsoft the next, and, and so on. Uh, but we're all operating in an extraordinarily difficult time right now. And uh, one of the reasons why it's difficult is because every one of your competitors and every one of your senior board has one big question in their mind, which is what on earth to replace the current business model with, because the current business model is bust. It can't continue. And what I want to do now is to uh, take you on a journey inside your own mind. My views of the future are completely irrelevant this afternoon. Okay? You can debate them if you want to, but I want you to use them simply as a springboard to find new moments of genius inside your own head. Because you are the future of Vodafone. It's inside and the technologies that you invent. It's the, it's the initiatives, it's the innovations which you are driving right now. I've talked to some of you. You're, you're involved in cutting-edge things that are going to transform, we hope, the future of this industry. Um, but th whether or not people will buy those things and pay enough to justify the future of Vodafone, that's the big question. And, and uh, So what I want you to do, I want you to think as we go through, not necessarily just about what I'm saying and whether you agree with it or not, because I may not necessarily agree with everything I'm going to say myself. <laughs> All right? This is a space where I want us to think. But I want you to think what you think the future will be. OK? And then you're going to have a chance to come back at me with some of that stuff. And we'll flip chart it out at very high speed. So I want you to write down odd words and phrases that come flinging through your mind before you, before you miss it. But before we go anywhere, I just want to ask one question. Where do you get your best ideas from? You are all leaders. That's why you're here. You are leaders of what you do. And I'd say this. You can't lead without a vision. All leadership is about having a vision of a better future, which is exciting and compelling and brings other people with you. Okay? So, and actually, as leaders, you only need one great idea every year. Why? Because it's hard to drive more than three major new initiatives at once, and each one usually takes three years to do. So, okay? So my question is, where does your genius come from as a leader? Where does that spark of the fresh vision and insight come? Where does this extraordinary revelation come to Xiaomin that will drive your leadership, Xiaomin, for the next three years? Where does it come from? Where, uh, put your hands up if those insights come to you at, at work, primarily. Put your hands up. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Sorry. No, I'm just pause for a moment. One. Not, two. Not my own. Okay, right. Put your hands up if you get most of your ideas, your moments of genius outside of work. Your really great ideas, they just come to you outside of work. Now, where do they come to you? Driving home. Driving home. <laughs> where do they come to you, Fernand? I'm having a drink with friends. A friend, a friend, drink with friends. Where do they come from? L lunchtime speaking with friends. Where did they come from, Shamin? Yeah, lunchtime pubs. Pubs? <laughs> Put your hands up if you get great ideas in the shower. <laughs> it's the, actually, I'm doing a global poll. I'm doing a global survey. I can tell you, of the last 45,000 people I have polled, 85% get their best ideas in the shower. <laughs> actually, I've exaggerated a little bit. It's only 55%, really. Uh, Put your hands up if you get so many great ideas in the middle of the night that you have to go to sleep with a piece of paper and a pen by your bed. Put your hands up. Now, what is it that happens to you? You go to work and you kiss all your innovation goodbye. You go to work and almost all fresh vision and insight disappears. You're just functioning. And what is it that happens inside your brains? When you're released from all of that stuff, why is it that you are having your, mo your best moments of genius outside the workplace? Please tell me. Relax. Why? Relax. 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 Yeah. Ten hours of firefighting all day long. Firefighting all day long. You can't think. Correct. Blame the idea. Yes, sorry? Blame the 
It's the range of ideas. What you think you get a bigger range when you're relaxed? Or when you're talking to a lot when of people. When you're talking to people. You get ideas from different You're connecting the things together. Yes, Janine. The noise goes away. The noise goes away. I call it unintentional genius. <laughs> it's the genius that surprises you when you were not expecting it. And I'll tell you that if you get nothing out of this entire week, understand this. If you can discover where it is that your genius is found and spend more time there, I guarantee you, you will be a great... Don't laugh, this is really important. You will be a great leader. Yes, indeed. Indeed, you have to be alive and in the workplace to have these genius moments because what's happening when your mind goes into neutral is you're connecting all the different pieces together that you've been grappling with and all these meetings and emails and noise together in a unique way. Okay, so what would we're looking to create here today, this morning, this already started, is some of the ingredients for you to have those moments of genius. And where are they going to happen? They're going to happen at four o'clock tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay. It's going to happen in the shower on Thursday. Frightening thought. Frightening thought. <laughs> it could happen walking the dog or going out for a drink with a friend in two weeks' time and finally that's where it all slots into place and something happens to you. So that's what we're looking for today. We're looking for some of the raw material for you to make that happen. Okay. Now, my first, my first comment I want to make about the future, and you've already heard a lot about it, is this. Don't. The biggest mistake is to try and look at one trend in isolation, okay? I will not do it. I refuse to talk about the future of telecom. That's what went wrong with the Pentagon war games. I, I went to talk to 500 generals from the Pentagon. I was the first non-American ever to address that audience about ways to reduce international tension. Why did they invite me in? Because they realized that one of the most dangerous things in the world for American generals is to spend too much time with other American generals. <laughs> and I'm not laughing. You see, the greatest risk for Vodafone is institutional blindness. That's the greatest risk for Google too and Microsoft. It's that we spend too much time with other people who are involved in IT innovation and systems and enterprise and all the rest of it inside Vodafone. And the only spare time you spend is in the pub with other people from other telco companies or IT companies or computing or this is a risk. So what we're trying to do is to look at the future in a wider way than that, okay? So, um, and uh, all these trends are related. So stuff happens in one part of the world, it triggers other things that happens elsewhere. Stuff happens, we live with all kinds of uncertainties. And I'll tell you this, I don't care who you are, strategies at the moment of just about every one of the largest multinationals in the world is getting overtaken by events. Things are happening in our world which are overtaking traditional business thinking. And it might be uh, 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 um, an event such as the, the possibility of, say, Greece leaving the Euro, it might be uh, uh, the Eurozone, it might be uh, an event uh, such as a single, a single earthquake which causes the meltdown of a single reactor. As a result of that, a whole nation changes its energy policy for the next 35 years. That, that, that nation is Germany. As a result of that, it puts extra pressure on energy prices in all kinds of other places. As a result of that, and interconnected in a funny way, we have new technology being launched in America for shale, shale oil and gas extraction. This extraordinary technology, I want to show it to you for a moment. It's nothing to do with your business, but it's an example of the kind of things that are happening in every business sector in the world which are overtaking strategy. Okay, so look at this. This is five years ago, we were told by the energy companies themselves that on their own estimates, they thought that we'd be out of gas worldwide within 60 years, even allowing for new technology. Five years later, they've revised their estimate, and they now say they think we have enough gas to last 200 years. Actually, they're wrong. It's at least 1,000 years, and I wrote a whole book about this. Um, and the reason is because they haven't even begun to look in the right place yet. Okay? There's plenty of gas around. The big question is that what cost to the environment and what cost to our economy to get that stuff out. Uh, but here's the issue. Look what happened to their strategy. They built whole strategies around nuclear uh, uh, reactors and the cost of coal and the cost of renewables and suddenly 
everything's changed. And if you don't believe me, if you look at the price of, uh, the price of, uh, of gas on, an a on a north axis, it, uh, for, it was up here uh, just four years ago. It's now down there. So we have coal-fired power stations going out of business. 57 coal-fired power stations were closed in America in the last 12 months. That was not in the plan. <laughs> it was to happen over a bit longer than that. Uh, another example of it is, uh, is what's been happening with solar power. Um, sorry. This is the gas prices here. Up. Look how high. <laughs> this is... 2004, naught up to 14 and a half. Now look at the gas prices. You can almost, in fact, it is so cheap that if you look from space, the flares from gas is brighter than any of the cities like Chicago in America. That's happened in a very short space of time. We look at solar power, uh, um, and you look at the price of solar cells. This wasn't supposed to happen. This fact was not supposed to happen for another six or seven years. It has. This is a, this is a technology very close to you. Intel's a client of mine. Chips is the same, whether they're in a computer or whether they're in a solar cell device. It's the same technology. It's all to do with scale. And the prices of these things have fallen so dramatically that we no longer need a government subsidy uh, in order to put them on your roof. Up to, we, uh, we thought that up until 2020, we would need to be able to, pay, to be paying Fern, Fern a huge amount of money just to persuade you to put them on the roof of your house. Now, the latest consignments that have come in in containers in October from China are so cheap that you can borrow money from your bank, put them on the roof of your house, and without any government subsidy, look to make money of it on it every single month simply by the cost of the electricity that you save. It's happening fast. And uh, I, and that's why my first comment is this, that you need more than one strategy to stay alive if you're a mobile, te mobile company or a telco. The days of having only one strategy are over. That's why you're in innovation, because you have plan A, but you're also investing in plan B, plan C. Because you're not quite sure exactly which one of these technologies is going to take off. Where your revenues are really going to come from. If you ask Eric Schmidt about the future of Google, uh, he will tell you uh, that he has no idea. He can't see more than 36 months ahead. In fact, he has difficulty seeing 18 months. All he can tell you is what's in the innovation lab. And he knows that a third of those things will go into the market and one-tenth of those will actually work. So he has more than one strategy, does Google. Many different strategies. And Vodafone needs more than one strategy too. And what I fear is that a lot of telcos are not going to survive in their current form because they have bet almost everything on only one strategy. We heard earlier about big bet on only one strategy. They were, okay, they were right, but it's a big risk, and Vodafone can't afford to take that risk. So I want to look at through the eyes of the customer now because, again, that's an area where we can easily become blind. What do I mean by that? I mean an old customer, a young customer. Actually, it could be a, a very old customer. I'll come to one in a moment. One of the problems we've, we haven't even worked out is the right size of a device. I noticed that some of you are now carrying devices which are even larger than this as mobile phones. So I'm expecting them to be this size in terms of the actual screen size within the next six months on current trends. I mean, how big do you want to go? And as, as, as devices get larger, they also get smaller. Uh, we can fit a device inside uh, a brain. Uh, and, uh, in fact, uh, we can do touch and voice and gesture and thought control and, and uh, just using cameras to watch us. Uh, and, uh, that's tomorrow, yes. Actually, the day after tomorrow is to control by thinking alone. Uh, we already have that technology for computer games, but to implant the chips is interesting. You see, I'm a physician in my first training, so I'm particularly interested in the opportunity for Vodafone to create biodigital brains. That obviously is where mobile technology is going, after all. You make it smaller and smaller. The interface is so clumsy. Do you know I can only speak to you at 100 words per minute? But you can think at 10,000 words per minute, easily. Because one picture is 1,000 words. You only have to have, see 10 pictures in your eye, in your imagination, and you're already thinking at 10,000 words per minute. So it's all about getting stuff in. Could we connect a mobile device 
right inside your brain? Yes, of course we can. Uh, here is one. Uh, this, is, uh, this is a brain, uh, this is brain tissue growing onto the surface of a chip. This chip is a traditional chip with just some projections to capture brain cells. We, we just uh, collect brain cells, we grow them, we shake them up, uh, we allow the brain cells to settle onto the surface of the chip. You bring the chip out, you then uh, wash it, and you put it in a warm place, and you make sure that the cells are fed some food so they can grow. And this is what happens. You see, all of you have brains which are programmed to connect with Vodafone devices. <laughs> okay, it's true. Every one of you has cells which will automatically, if I grow your brain cells onto the surface of a chip, this is what they would do. They grow branches looking for intelligent life. And when they find electrical currents, they put out more branches and you get bandwidth. It's, uh, uh, that's true, you get it just one cell to the other, they produce connections. And the more electrical connections there are, the bigger the cable becomes. But if you grow them on the surface of the chip, and there are electrical signals on the surface of the chip, the brain cells think they found home. And every time they sense a, uh, an electrical signal, they grow another branch. And you get bandwidth between brain cells and brain cells and brain cells and uh, the surface of the chip, biodigital brain. And uh, we have been implanting these devices into mice and rats for over 10 years. And these mice and rats communicate using mobile technology, 3G technology and other things like that, Wi-Fi, and they connect each brain, each brain to the other brain using mobile signals. So they are, these mice and rats are able to send each other a thought. Uh, so here's a mouse in a cage here, and the, there is another one in Australia. And the mouse here is thirsty, but he cannot get water. All he can do is send a thought. He is sending a thought, this is absolutely true, he is sending a thought to another mouse in Australia or another, somewhere else. The other mouse is interpreting that thought, and he then presses a lever in his cage. He then gets a drink. This mouse says, thank you. Thank you. Mouse over here gets a reward. Now, you know, of course, I mean, you, you are all excited by technology. I can see that you all want these devices inside your brain. Put your hands up if you would like one. I have one here. <laughs> Put your hands up if you would like me to give you one of these. <laughs> okay, put your hands up if you are certain that this is not the way for you to go. You see, my friends, we've learned something very important about technology. I couldn't care less about how clever your innovations are. We talked about the Symbian operating system. Nokia's been a client of mine for years. The question is this. Is the technology that you create going to be something that people are passionate about? Because we begin to learn. We, we can see the future of mobile. I've just shown you. And you're saying, no. You see, the future of mobile is not about being clever. The future of mobile is connecting with passion. It's no longer about what we can do. That's history. It's about what we actually want. And that is the most important lesson we have to learn when it comes to innovation. And I can give you hundreds of examples of technology innovation which has failed to engage people and has been consigned to the rubbish tip of history. And I don't care whether you're doing uh, a, an enterprise solution for a customer in a business or whether you're providing a new method of streaming video at half the price for someone in the retail market. It's the same. It's about, it's about touching emotion. It's about understanding how people feel. Let me give you another example of it, of this emotion thing. Um, time. The perception of time is changing dramatically. Um, let's imagine that you're watching TV and uh, you're trying to get out of Wikipedia the name of the artist that... Uh, that is on the show, okay? You want the biography. 
And you, well, Wikipedia isn't a good example, actually, because it's usually a very fast site. But you've gone to some site or other, some entertainment guide, and you press the button, and <laughs> how long do you wait before you click the back button? Three or four seconds. Three or four seconds. Put your hands up if you wait less than three seconds before you press the back button. Okay. Uh, what is one, two, three, four, five? Would it be fair to say that you've just lost 30% of all your business in three seconds? <laughs> yes? No. That's today. You tell me tomorrow. I want you to just keep that figure in mind. 30% in three seconds. How long would it take a website to lose 80% of its traffic before you press the back button? How many seconds? Five? Five, you think? Yeah, could be. If you are, I suggest that if you're in a remote part of India where the bandwidth is slow, you will probably be more tolerant, okay? But I suggest to you that if you are in New York, in McDonald's, you will wait five seconds before 80% have gone, right? I just want to hang on to that figure. That's yesterday, so tell me tomorrow. In what year do you think it will be two seconds to lose 80% of all of your traffic? What year do you think? You're the futurist, not me. What do you think? 2015? 2018? 2018? Actually, I think it's coming sooner than that. Next year. You watch people my children's age. They wait half a second. <laughs> if it doesn't load in half a second, they think the site has crashed. <laughs> next, next. Put your hands up if you have recently tried to buy car insurance online. How long did it take you? Uh, 15 minutes. 15 minutes. 20? I failed. You failed. <laughs> what does it feel like when you can't even get insurance after 20 minutes? Remember, you've told me that three seconds is enough to make you so mad you want to kill the site, okay? So I just wanted to understand the future is about emotion. It's no longer about the web or being clever. I'm trying to help you to understand how irritated you feel after two seconds. Here's another thing. Oh, here's my mum. <laughs> my mum is here. My dad died, sadly, a few years ago. And she phoned me up one day and she said, look, I have always said I would never do any banking online. I never want to have email and anybody who gives their details over the phone with a credit card is mad. But I had to change my mind because Everyone communicates by Facebook and email, and then they write me a postcard, and then I miss all my social life. So please, can you come and put me online? So I went, I went round. I wondered if she was ill and needed psychological help, <laughs> because this is such a big change for her. And she said, no, look in my eyes. I need you to take me shopping now. So we went shopping to the biggest computer shop I could find. She said she wanted a skipping computer. She knew about video. Skype was what she wanted. She knew it had to have a broad, it had a broad and a band in it somewhere. And it would all be wireless in the garden. So we came back, of course, with a, a complete package. That, uh, she wanted the best, so it's the fastest and the most powerful PC I could possibly provide that she could physically carry around the garden. Uh, she, I put Wi-Fi in the house. We bought a nice smartphone. She can see everything. Video calls, it's great. She's sending emails to her friends in 24 hours. The following day, she phones me. Patrick! I said, yes? It, there's something very wrong with this machine. I said, what's that? Well, the, the computer's fine, but the phone is rubbish. She says, I'm phoning my bank, but they say they can't see me. I said, well, I'm not surprised. I don't think they have video in their call centers. <laughs> really? <laughs> what happened was, what happened, they, you see, the bank made a fundamental error. They had listened to my mother and believed what she said. You should never believe market research. Listen to people, but don't believe them. See, my wife, my, my, my mother had, my, my wife, not my wife, my mother had told the bank for 30 years do not even talk to me about online banking. 
Telephone banking I don't even want. I want you to come and see me, okay? So for 30 years, they had deliberately produced exactly what my mother said she wanted. And then one day, she moved 30 years into the future in three hours and left the bank behind. Here's the question. How long will it take Barclays Bank to video enable all of their call centers using Vodafone technology? Two years. How long will it take them to make the decision in the board? Another two years. And in four years' time, what kind of technology do you think they have and do you think my mother will still be using it? Well, she'll be probably moved on. So what we begin to see is the real risk of blindness. We get propelled by things which we think our customers want, which they don't. We go, we go too clever for things which they are never going to use. And we find that um, our customers tell us lies about the future and we believe them and we build all the wrong stuff. So what's the right answer? The right answer is we need to listen carefully to my mother. We need to absolutely respect what she says. If she says she's fed up because she gets through to you and she can't get through quickly, we need to listen to what she says and put it right. She's talking about things now. Let's put it right. But when it comes to longer term, if you're thinking about what kind of customer she'll be in three years' time, she doesn't know. You know, maybe because you are, in, you, are, you have before you the tools of the future. You are creating the tools of the future. So what we need to do together is future my mother. We need to know her better than she knows herself here in her world. And then we need to build a vision of what her future world could be with our help and try to imagine how she might behave if she could see that, which she can't and then we will find ourselves in a much better place to go into the future. Now, okay, so here's present. Here's my mother now, and you too. Put your hands up if you get through to a call center, and they press, so press one for accounts, press two for customer service. We do think your call's important, please hang on. Put your hands up if you find that really annoying. Put your hands up and keep them up. If you find it so annoying that you think that anyone that puts a, such a system into the, into the electricity company should be put in prison and the key thrown away. <laughs> My next question is, put your hands up if in your part of the world you are using such a system for some of your most important customers. Oh, what happened? <laughs> Please. You have told me that two seconds is enough to make you really mad. And now that you, you, you're getting the press about every button is another five second press. So what I'm saying is we need to have a reality check here. Because if we're, if we're not careful, we are, we are, we'll find ourselves constructing a company for a future that no longer exists, from business models which are utterly bust, broken, and we will find ourselves gone. Okay? Because if that's today, how annoyed will your customers be tomorrow in this 10-second wait? Now, I'm not saying we should get rid of call centers and automated systems, but what's, what it should do, and, and you have the technology, you have built it. You know, uh, you'll say, we can put in the technology which sees me coming in. You recognize me from my incoming mobile phone number, and your own algorithms can predict with a 95% accuracy the reason for the call, correct? On the first call, you know. You know me, you know my account, you have done the analysis. So you can probably put me right through immediately to the right department, and if we have a one customer view, as we were hearing about earlier, which I'll come back to, it shouldn't matter too much anyway, because whoever takes the call can see the entire situation. Now, we're a long way from that, but um, here's another example of extraordinary blindness. A Vodafone technology and your back-end systems and processes are fundamental to so many businesses. Let me think about call centers for a moment. Not your call centers. Your customers' call centers. Let's imagine I'm a travel company. So here I am. I'm, I'm an agent, okay? So I sit in front of my screen, which has the script on it. And I've got the headset on. Hello, can I help you? And the script is guiding me through. And it says, I would like to, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in your online offer. It's great. 
And the first problem is I probably can't see the offer. I'm seeing the intranet version of the offer, which is different from the pages which are online. And I tell you, that is often the case. Even more of the problem is that, that uh, Jamie is telling me I can see a competitor's offer for 50% less for the same flight and the same hotel. And you're saying, really? And I'm saying, really? <laughs> I can't see it. Why? Because they've blocked my internet access because they don't want me to use Facebook. It's true. It's true. And actually, even if I could see it, I'd have to get rid of my script in order to have a look. But Jamie, who's talking to me, Jamie has he's been, he's got the TV on. I can see that. I, he's got an iPad in front of him on which he has 18 web pages already open. His desktop in the corner there of his home office has another 15 web pages, and he's, he's actually walking towards it now to look at some other pages. He's got an iPhone in his pocket, and he's on his BlackBerry. And the friend's going, <laughs> because they are also ha are sitting on the sofa over there, and they've just found an even better offer. And here I am, and I'm completely blind. Isn't that crazy? So we see call center technology is hardly advanced. Now, I'm just saying, this is another example of quite literally blindness. Here is someone who is totally blind to a multi-channel, multitasking consumer in a completely different world. So, okay. So, yeah, we talked about fridges earlier. I, I had a fridge uh, back in, oh, 19, what year was this? 1999, I think, because Tesco uh, enabled my fridge, so, you know, you click and throw away and another one comes through the door. Was it any good? No. Useless. This is useless. I mean, put your hands up if you actually like to surf the internet on the, on the door of your fridge. <laughs> I mean, it's balmy. It's completely, it's, it's, it's technology gone stark, <laughs> raving mad. Here is another example. Here is a fantastic offering from Intel. I'm so sorry we should take that off the tape. But this is Intel's offering a <laughs> surfboard that you can surf and surf on the web and email and on the sea. <laughs> at the same time. It's fantastic. Here's another example of convergence. You see, convergence tells us that everything is everywhere. Internet is in the surfboard. The surfboard becomes a bank. Great. Here's another example. Convergence tells us that this is last century and we are all going to have one of these. These cost one euro. Put your hands up if you own one. This is a universal remote to get rid of all these horrible things. Put your hands up if you have one. Only one of you has it. You are the techno enthusiast of the world. You are at the cutting edge of all innovation. You are the people who love to spend money on technology, and you're still all using these. Even though this costs one euro. Why? Because of what? Emotion. It's because you are emotionally attached. You go to bed with these under your pillow. They are a part of your psychological future. <laughs> it's true. Oh, and maybe it actually costs 15 to 20 euros, but considering how much you pay for an iPhone, that's not very much. <laughs> and my friends... Yes. <laughs> I'm just helping you to understand that this convergent story, I just wanted to provide a counterbalance. Remember, I don't necessarily believe everything I'm going to say, but it just make, wants to make us think that actually the future is about divergence. Some of the future is about divergence. Why is that? Well, you see, I would argue that all convergence is boring and no one makes money from it. I'm very bored with cars these days. My wife and I own an MG which is 38 years old and it looks like a car. It feels like a car. It's unique. It's special. All the cars today, actually 80% of them in the UK, are grey. Did you know? Grey is the almost universal car colour these days. They're all designed in a wind tunnel. They all have the same features. They all have electronic locking. They have uh, uh, um, uh, air conditioning. They have the digital radio. They have uh, APS brake. They have the windbag. Every time they produce an innovation, one manufacturer produces an innovation, there is convergence. Everyone else decides to do the same. Um, uh, every single car has the same stuff in it. The only difference is, well, they all have the same number of wheels, the same number of seats. 
it's boring. And actually, it's really bad news for making money. It's the same with phones. They all look the same. Actually, it's really difficult. And as for these iPads, the iPad, the only difference is that this one's cracked and the other one isn't. But I mean, quite frankly, an iPad is starting to look very convergent product, isn't it? Really? So tell me, where does your competitive advantage come in a convergent world? Because everyone will copy you. They let iPad go out and make the mistake. And maybe... Hmm? You can Early, yes, if you're lucky. So you make money by being divergent. See, when this came out, it was so divergent that we had uh, one of the biggest business people in the UK saying it was rubbish. Because it was so different, it was literally off-center. In, in, uh, we call that eccentric, off-center. Weird, peculiar, bizarre. Why would you do it? It's a complete nonsense. That is a divergent product. And iPad had got it right because they had, uh, they had somehow managed to future my mother. Do you know one of the biggest buyers of iPads are people over the age of 65? Yeah. Why? Because you can make the screen larger. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I, I just want to see that if all innovation, all innovation, true innovation, I'm not talking about copycat innovation. I'm not talking about innovation where we say, oh, his car has got a satellite navigation welded into the cockpit. We will do the same. I'm talking about, uh, or, or, or now let's make sure ours also has live traffic data. That is pure convergence. It is not clever. It is absolutely stupid. It's simply looking at what other people buy, doing the maths, and seeing if you can make it for cheaper. And that is what happens to convergent people. They go spiraling down, more and more features, more and more the same, and they go down on price, and that is not where you want to be. So where you want to be, if you're a Vodafone, it's a bit different. We have found a stunning new business model. We've got a completely different price packaging. We've got a totally different approach to customer service. We've got a radical way of re-engineering enterprise software solutions that completely transforms how the, how the efficiency of that business that no one else has got anywhere near. And as soon as everyone else starts converging onto your territory, you've gone somewhere else. Left them all behind to flight it out. I'll give you another example of, uh, of, uh, of divergence. It's this thing, which I printed out at home. Uh, it's slow. But it's the same price as a color jet printer was about 10 years ago. Actually, it is so intricate, you couldn't manufacture that as a single unit. But that came out of my printer as a single device. And what's really interesting about it is it allows you as telecom to go into manufacturing. Because you can send a physical object through space from one side of the world to the other. And most fascinating of all, would be to put this object in a scanner, in your home, and on the other side of the world, courtesy of Vodafone mobile technology, Nikolai has an identical product coming out in his home. So teleporting of physical objects is an interesting part of the future. Now, um, I'm just saying it's a divergent thing. It's different from the idea of traditional manufacturing. <coughs> okay, so. Let me just go through some other things much more quickly, OK? Why old, telecom why old telco models are going bust? Well, here's, here's an example. Sorry about the layout. A two-hour video, as you know, a two-hour video watched on a fairly low resolution is equivalent to 200,000 text emails. A high resolution, um, I mean, if you're talking about two gig streamed over, t I mean, how many emails is that? It's, 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 it's two million, three million? Four, five. What we come to conclusion quite quickly is that if you're thinking about video, a high resolution video is equivalent to hundreds of thousands of phone calls, an almost infinite amount of email, and in fact, the idea of charging for phone calls and emails and SMS is gone. The only thing that really matters is video, and I'll just come back to this, uh, get, just have a look at what it means in a bit more detail. If you look at the total bandwidth, we've been talking about total bandwidth, and we can argue how quickly it's doubling. 
uh, but it, it is, it, bandwidth is growing. Almost all of that bandwidth growth is video. Uh, if we look at uh, mobile phones in, in France, uh, this is a, a secret story, so I can't name the company. Uh, but it's true. Uh, uh, recently, one of the largest telcos in France uh, signed a, a contract with a very small distributor of a bandwidth that allowed that company to go on selling to retail um, their own airtime packages. And they forgot to cap the contract. And what was happening is they were selling iPhones and other devices basically with an unlimited cap on streaming. I guess how much gigabytes, how many gigabytes, these average users were using. It's about 13 gigabytes every four days. You think, well, what on earth were they doing? They had to be watching DVDs all night. We don't quite know what they were doing. <laughs> but they were doing a lot of it. <laughs> Singapore, a few minutes in the shopping centre, the 40 seconds it takes from the bottom to the top of the escalator, well that's long enough to open your device and start watching a TV programme. Because two seconds is an eternity, 40 seconds, plenty of time. So, world speeding up, it's all to do with video, video being used anywhere and everywhere, and video dwarfing just about everything else. Um, and, yeah, let's just think about that for a moment. Already, uh, I mean, uh, two years ago, 70% of all UK bandwidth came from two websites. 70% of all UK use of the web. What were the two websites? YouTube and? No. No. Facebook consumes zero bandwidth. Why? Because it's just text and photographs. You can have millions of them. But just keep off the video. The one site that consumed 40% of all UK bandwidth was just one TV company called the BBC. Just with one player, because they happened to get there first. At, on current trends, it will not be long, it will not be long before 95% of all bandwidth in the European Union is simply streaming video. The rest is nonsense. So why is the business model broken? I'll tell you why. Because if 95% of all the bandwidth on your networks is video, or will be soon, and you're still charging contracts based on voice minutes and SMS, and you've got a little bit of data per month with a limit on it, that is so last century. What we should be doing is saying, basically, you have a video contract and all the rest is free. Hello? That's the way it's going. So, Actually, what's your business about? Is your business about voice? No. Is it about SMS? Absolutely not. Is it about email? Absolutely no way. Is it about Facebook? No. Is it about LinkedIn? No. What is it about? It's about video. Yeah. So. Uh, by the way, here's a typical, typical one of your customers. How many contracts has he got? Oh, is it a he or a she? He, yes. How did you know? <laughs> okay. The train and the mess, of course. So, firstly, how many contracts has he got running? Can you count them? He should have one, but how many do you think he's actually got? What do you think, is, what do you, what, what do you think he pays per month? They're all on, on a monthly basis. He's got, a, he's got an iPad, yes, he's got an iPad contract, which may well be a different company than any other. Yeah, what else has he got? IPhone. He's got an iPhone, he's almost certainly got a Blackberry on that desk somewhere. Uh, he's got, a, he's got a physical uh, uh, broadband coming in, hasn't he? He's got, yeah, I would think he's probably got a fixed line. Um, he's, he may well have a subscription to some kind of service that allows him to have Wi-Fi in other, other locations. Um, yeah. Oh, by the way, where is he? I mean, he obviously hasn't gone far. Where is he? He's in the toilet. <laughs> What's he doing in the toilet? He's been there for 25 minutes. What's he doing in there? <laughs> hmm? <laughs> what? Using his second 
iPad. So good his iPad, yeah, so good iPad. Yeah, what's he? Getting hmm? getting He's getting ideas. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, uh, well, what do you think seriously? Uh, uh, you know what? See, one of those stupid call centers, these blind, blind call center operators has phoned him. He says, hello, is that Richard? Yes. <laughs> He's sitting on the toilet. Does she know? No. What's he doing? He's now surfing the internet on the toilet to check what she says is correct. I'm just saying that we need to be thinking, you know, uh, traditional marketing is dead too. The idea, you know, say we're going to have digital multi-channel customers. No, 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 no. These are, these are uh, multi-dimensional customers who are living simultaneously in their work and their leisure worlds, who are online and offline, who are uh, shopping and they're not shopping. They're shopping in a retail store. They're shopping in a retail store, but they're using your device, your mobile device, to, phys to, to, to order the goods online, to be connected, collected in a few hours at another branch of the same store. They, they are shopping online and buying it, and then going and collecting it physically in the store. The whole world is fusing into one. It's a very complicated place for retailers, wholesalers, and for telco companies. This guy is online somewhere else. We are really interested in where he is. That's the most important fact for us. You, you have, and your fingertips in your databases, I know that you, uh, you've got huge innovation going on in terms of your analytics in California. That's exactly what you should be doing, because the most important thing is not what he's doing, it's where he is. Because that tells you how he's feeling. And if you know how he's feeling, you know how to connect with him and to make the decision. But why does knowing where he is tell you how he's feeling? Because when you combine that with what you know he's been doing, for instance, is he in the theatre or a restaurant or is he at work? Very important. Is he at school collecting his child? If he is, don't call him now. It's absolutely critical to know where the person is. Even better if you know where they are physically within the building, even more. You'll know they're in a conference room, they're at their own desk, or they're in the cafeteria. You have three completely different conversations with the same person at work. One of the reasons why I find it, I, I dislike taking calls on a mobile, I find it so impersonal. It's so rude. They have no idea what they're interrupting, and they come crashing into my life, yeah? Isn't that right? Yeah. And we accept it. We accept it. Yeah. If I walk around the corner just now at lunchtime, I was looking for somewhere to sit. Where shall I sit? And I'm thinking not just an empty chair, I'm seeing what part of the course are they on? Who else is sitting there? Are they in a conversation like they're busy doing some deal, or can I join in? All this kind of emotional intelligence is going on before I decide where to sit. But the phone is completely blind. Well, you can turn it into something that can see, because you know. You know where I am, you know at what speed I'm physically moving. You know that I must be either driving a car or I'm in a taxi. You know where I've come from, my home. Your predictive technology has already told you where I'm going, which is work, because I always go to work at that time of day. So you are you're now right inside my life, and that's even without being able to capture transactions. Um, and of course, when you couple it with radio frequency identification device technology, the technology of things we talked about, so you, uh, you, now we know that I'm sitting in a cab, and the cab knows I'm there, it doesn't know who I am, but the cab has read my glasses, it's read the RFID on my glasses, the cab driver knows, the cab's technology, the taxi technology knows that I, uh, I like brand names, because of the, they can read the brand. It knows that I have bifocals, which means that I need reading glasses, which means I'm over 50. It can see that I have higher income because of the brand of the glasses. And straight away, the advert comes up on the TV screen inside the taxi or into my mobile phone using... Apparently at random... Uh, a laser-corrected eye surgery. <laughs> now, you're absolutely right. We're hearing about spooking. One of the greatest challenges of retail right now, and for you, is you get too clever. Remember, I told you, the future is not about technology. It's not about being clever. It's about being emotionally sensitive. And you start bombarding me with all kinds of messages that makes it think that you're reading my brain, and I will be very upset. So the laser correction thing has to come as if by accident. Along with a stream of consciousness about other things as well, it just comes up with laser, it's up there for five seconds and goes on. 
but it just but you, what you the customer doesn't know is the sheer sheer Vodafone analytical genius behind that engine, and uh, that's Google's problem right now. Google can be much cleverer than it is being at the moment in terms of its search results. Google is deliberately winding down a lot of its search results to make otherwise it would just freak you out. Okay. Um, uh, here's another example, uh, which uh, this is the fusion of mobile. So I walk along towards the Coke machine using my mobile device. Ding dong, says you are one meter, two meters, three meters. You're walking the wrong way. If you turn around, your favorite drink will come out of the Coca-Cola machine. Why is that? Because there's an app, of course. The app sees the mobile phone. The app can detect, this machine can detect that my mobile phone is within 10 meters. It has sent the SMS automatically. Uh, the machine has already been programmed. This is true already been programmed to produce a unique flavors. It has the pre-packaged flavors and a unique flavor for me, my customized drink, in the memory of Coca-Cola in the cloud. And I'm told as I walk towards the machine, clonk, clonk, out comes my favorite drink. As I pick it up, the machine deducts the cost on my, on my mobile phone. So we're talking about a world where Yes, everything's moving into the cloud, just like the multinationals are following ordinary people. We've been in the cloud as individuals for five years or ten. Of course, Gmail, Facebook, LinkedIn, uh, YouTube, our entire worlds have been cloud-based for some time. It's just that multinational companies are struggling to get into the future. Um, how has Google changed? Google is in trouble. See, Google, it's easy to be blind. Why? You can spend too much time being too clever with search engine algorithms. And along comes other algorithms to undermine your algorithms. And you have this war going on between marketing companies and Google. Google trying to produce the right listings and marketing companies trying to make sure that their products come to the top. Right. So what happens is Google begins to is saved just in the nick of time. The thing that has saved Google is one word, one phrase, which is social networks. Without social networks, the Google algorithm was getting pro pro progressively undermined. So Google realized, and Facebook realized, which is why Facebook has now gone into search, as I predicted. Google and Facebook know that whoever controls social networks will control the future of search, and whoever controls the future of search will control the future of online. And the reason is this. They've realized that actually there's only one that matters once you've done the basic analysis, and that is how many people that you know well, or people who think like NOLA, whose brains are programmed in the same kind of way, with the same kind of interests, personality profile, and stage of life, and living in the same area, working for a similar company, how many people like you, when they're presented with a thousand different websites, would find that there's just two of them that really are important? And if you can find that out, you've solved the problem. And you've solved it in a way that the spammers, the marketing spammers, can't fix. So that's why Google has gone so big into search. They tried launching their G+, that hasn't worked particularly well. Uh, but it's, a, it's, it's the end of hype. It's the end of marketing. It's the end of spin. It's the end of stuff. It's all about trust. It's all about things like Facebook. It's all about relationship. TripAdvisor is just one site, a review site. As you know, I'm sure you've all been there. Imagine you type in the name of a London hotel, and the first thing comes up saying it's the most fantastic place. The second is awful. I nearly died, rats, food poisoning. You've got one choice, <laughs> one click. You either go to one of these two, or you go to the official website, which has now been pushed onto a pay-per-click thing on the right. Which do you go for first? Put your hands up if you go for the wonderful stay first. Put your hands up if you go for the rats first. Okay. Put your hands up if you don't believe either of them. You go for the official site written by the marketing department. Well, you see, you're typical. And I can tell you that al almost everyone in the world will go straight for the story of the rats. Only one problem with this. Who wrote the story about the rats? 
Competitor, of course. And who wrote the story about the wonderful honeymoon? The hotel. Yeah. Exactly. There's lots of legal cases about this at the moment. And you don't do it under the hotel name or you get fined by, by supervisor. No, you do it subtly. You, you, get, you phone the, a friend who's got a neighbor who's got a brother and he's got a friend and you pay him $10 and he does it. That's a problem with these social networks. But it's the power of them. Now, here's an interesting thing. You knew the truth because you are sophisticated people. You knew that both of these were probably made up. But you all went for the rats. You knew that it was likely that uh, the official marketing department was actually more accurate than either of them. But you still went for the rats. So what it shows us is that marketing is dead in the online world. You've shown me that. What you've shown me is that the opinion of a perfect stranger, even if you think they're a liar, will still be more powerful for you in the choices you make than anything that can be produced by Vodafone's publicity department. Yeah? So now we begin to see emotion again. But actually, emotion is very powerfully generated by consumer comment. And that Vodafone's entire future will be made not by clever innovation, not just by the emotional connection that your innovation has with the customers, but to be made as a result of the emotional connection that your customers have with you as an organization and with each other. And I have to say, this is creeping up now. You know, in the olden days, you just paid money in your marketing department and you paid to get your, your pay-per-click adverts up here on the right. It doesn't work anymore. Google is now ranking the ads. So you're now starting to see stars come up on the right-hand side here. And if your ad does not get enough popularity ratings on it, it will no longer show on Google. It doesn't care. You can have $1 billion to spend, but Google won't put you there. So uh, the writing's there on the wall for us in terms of building trust and understanding that it's all about the one customer experience. It's about understanding what my mother wants, being really close to her, uh, understanding her inside out and back to front. Finally, I just want to say something about payments. For me, uh, uh, for the last uh, 10 years, every time I've gone near a large bank, I've said, uh, watch out, you need to become a telco. And every time I've gone near a large telco, I've said, watch out, you need to become a bank. And I'm going to ask you a question in a moment, and I'm going to benchmark your uh, responses. We have 100 new mobile payment systems launched in the last 18 months. We have, uh, uh, we've had 200 million mobile payments globally in the last year, 80% of them in Africa, almost all of them in East Africa. You might think that mobile payment innovation is happening in developed countries, it isn't. Almost all of the mobile payments in the world have happened in one country, which is Kenya, using a system called M-Pesa, correct. Um, and uh, just look how mobile payments have grown from naught to uh, more than four billion in PayPal in just one, two, three years. This is a phenomenon which is growing. It should make you either excited or alarmed when you go to sleep at night. Kenya, 17 million customers. One third of Kenya's GDP is traded on M-Pesa. One third. Can you imagine that in the UK? Uh, uh, Tanzania has, uh, has just opened up M-Pesa. They already have 39 million people using it. There are more people in Africa have access to mobile than electricity, as some of you know very well. And uh, safekeeping is much more important than saving money. It's, keeping, it's, 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 it's not the saving, it's the moving of cash from one place to another at the speed of light. It's making sure that the cash still is in the system, that you can get it out um, whenever you need. 1.7 billion phone users in the world have no bank account. Think about it. Banks get a rough ride in the UK, but I tell you this, a world without banks is a living hell. How do I know that? Because of Zimbabwe. I have in my... In my pocket here, a $10 trillion banknote printed in Zimbabwe. Uh, that's not the problem in Zimbabwe. Actually, um, I've been involved in an AIDS program in Zimbabwe feeding orphans when the inflation was running at 1 billion percent. No problem. That's not the problem. The problem was no banks. I can cope with an inflation rate, 
But when you've got a bank, and we've tried, you put money into one bank account in London, and it goes to a, a, a Zimbabwean bank, and then between one Zimbabwean bank and another, the money goes walkabout, that's a problem. When you have people that are completely unbanked, they wear their, wh where, where do you find their wealth? It's gold, and where do they wear it? Around their neck. So if you're a mother and you've got a three-year-old child, all I have to do is stick a knife towards your child, and you will give me all of your gold, there and then. So your entire wealth is as vulnerable as one man with one knife, with one child, in one scary moment. That is an unbanked world. You have 1.7 billion people, many of whom are your customers. You have 100 million customers in India alone. Where are you from India? 100 million customers in India alone, correct? And I'm going to take a guess that at least 70 million of them have no bank account. And I'm certainly going to take a guess that that proportion will increase as you roll out and expand so that more lower income people get hold of your technology, you'll find it goes up even more, from 70% to 85% even, in some parts of India, will be completely unbanked. What an amazing opportunity this is. Not just to put in an MP, you just launched an MPSA type system, I know. But that's just phase 1A. We put that forward five years and we start to think about what kind of world that you could start to be managing for people and forget the SMS or the email or the even uh, the other bits and pieces. We're talking about a completely different relationship with the phone. Um, uh, um, in South Africa, who's here from South Africa? Uh, you know there's already 65% of all search requests at weekends are on mobile. Already. Uh, we're, we're dealing with an extraordinarily exciting transformation. And very large numbers of, of people uh, are using mobile are shifting towards internet. I think it's, an, it's hard to overstate the significance of these changes. So I think that at least 200 million people will gain their first financial services access using mobile technology in the next 12 months. Now we're beginning to see the possibility of new business models. Um, two million businesses are already using Square in the US. Who has seen Square here? Uh, put your hands up if you've already taken a credit card payment using your mobile phone. One. You all ought to do it. Just, you should do it. Why? Because it's free and life's too short. <laughs> the future is about mobile payments. It's about this kind of technology. Yes, convergence. Here is a device which costs me absolutely nothing. I pop it straight in here. You give me a credit card and I can take a payment from you in less than five seconds. It's true they'll take a commission. 2.3%, but that's what all the, all the, uh, all the devices do uh, around London. Uh, but we're talking about a very big transformation because it means that a trader in India who has, in a small village, where there is no electricity, but he does have a mobile phone and a battery pack, he can now take a credit card payment or receive a credit card trans transaction using his technology. We are an, on the edge of something really extraordinary, as I say. Um, and... Um, what I'd like you to do is to put it all together and tell me what it means for your business models. Um, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the nirvana is to put f uh, fingerprint recognition on this as well. Um, let me just uh, skip. Okay. Yes, Barclays Ping It has just, uh, has just launched. They've had in the last few months 1.2 million downloads in the UK alone. 80% of people that receive a payment using an SMS and the Pingit system register. 15 to 20% of these customers are not Barclays customers. Of that big this is your territory. This should be your, 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 your future, but it's being taken by Barclays. Why on earth is Barclays being allowed to dominate micropayments in the UK? I cannot imagine. Because you're going to be left as simply be charging for the bandwidth of handling the transaction. You're going to be left with zero revenue in this process, or virtually nothing, uh, except being able to charge for videos. Great. So, uh, just skip through. I mean, okay. So let's imagine a hypothetical partnership between Vodafone, Nokia, Google, American Express, in the UK. Let's imagine a world where every smartphone has now got uh, fingerprint recognition on it. Every flat screen you put your finger on there, it knows who you are. 
So now we can have secure credit card transactions for up to $100,000 at the speed of light uh, with no other company involved. And uh, we can capture, let's think of it, we can capture $600 billion a year of transactions. That's on cards at the moment. $60 billion of debt. Average interest rate at 16%. Great. Now, look, this is the slide I want to finish on. This is the slide. I've been showing a slide like this to boards and senior teams of some of the largest telcos and the largest banks over the last five years. I asked them a question, and I'm asking you the same question. And I will benchmark your answer against theirs, OK? Here's the, here's the issue. You, we've, we heard about Moore's Law today, and we can quarrel about the exact speed at which it's happening, but the fact is that the cost of technology is falling towards zero, OK? Yep. The cost of telco... The cost of bandwidth per gigabyte is falling towards zero. Yep. The cost of providing a new iPad for you every year falling towards zero. It isn't zero, but nearly so. You saw what happened to gas prices. That's your future. It's not a good place to be. The cost of the, the, uh, the income that we could get from capturing mobile transactions by moving them from credit cards onto the mobile system is rising exponentially. At some point, these two lines cross. I want you to tell me in which year do you think it is. Is it 2050, or is it 2020, or 2015? What happens when these two lines cross is this. See, I go to Mohammed and I say, hey, this iPhone's cracked. Would you like a new one for free? And he says, sure, yes. I say, would you like two? Because I'm sure you've got a partner or a child or something. I'll give you two iPads. I will change those iPads every 12 months for free. Would you like that? I say, he, yeah, 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 yeah. I said, by the way, I'll give you, I'll give you whatever, an edge tech phone or an iPhone. I'll give you two mobile phones, latest generation smartphone technology. We change them every 12 months. You've got four devices now. By the way, do you have broadband at home? Yes, yes, yes. I will give you broadband. Have you got a movie package? Do you use Love Film or uh, Sky? What do you use? And you say, I'll give you three unlimited movies. You can have as many movies as you like on a mobile or on the, but not out of your country, okay? Only in Egypt, mm. all right? I'm not that generous. <laughs> and you say, yeah, that's okay, but what's the catch? And you say, you're unlimited, yes, okay, I get it. Unlimited SMS, unlimited voice calls, unlimited, yeah, yeah, I understand, but what do I have to do? And you say, take your wallet out. Take your wallet out. You haven't got it, okay. Take your wallet out, all the cards on the desk, all of them. Right, okay. You can keep one. Which one are you going to choose? Let's say American Express, okay? Right, you keep your American Express. Here's the deal. And we'll be looking. $1,000 maximum a month on American Express. Nowhere else. No more cards. Okay? What we do is we load all of that onto the mobile phone. Just believe me, it works. You don't need to, need to understand how. It just works. It won't cost you anything. In fact, it's free. And you say, well, how do you do it? So, well, it's easy because we charge all the merchants 2.5%. The technology costs us virtually nothing. We don't have to have any of this last century stuff. It's all digital. It's all done by Vodafone. You should see our technology innovation department. They're really clever. And we make so much money on this. Actually, you know what? We make a lovely profit on this. Um, and it's the days of having a contract over. I mean, no one's going to go into a mobile phone shop and actually buy a mobile phone anymore. It's just a question of which mobile device you'd like with your financial services. Are you ready to sign? Fine, just sign here. It's a 24-month contract, and we will give you your new devices will arrive tomorrow by FedEx, and you'll get your new devices a year later. Thank you. Uh, you get new devices now, and then in a year you'll get your next lot of new devices, and if you renew the contract, we'll carry on. Now... Put your hands up if you think that that could happen. Some company could start offering such a, such a package within the next 10 years. Put your hands up. And of course, you've read the headlines because it's already here, correct? OK. Just look at Singapore. It started already. Put your hands up if you think it could happen in a European country within the next five years. OK. Now, what you've told me, my friends, I just want you to hold up a mirror to you. What you've told me, and I'm not going to repeat it outside this room, you, what you told me is exactly the same as every large bank has told me, and every large telco has told me, and every large IT company has told me, and every phone manufacturer has told me exactly the same, which is that they expect this is inevitable, 
You see, most debates about the future are not about what is going to happen. What's going to happen is obvious. It's only timing. Now, you've told me the future. You've told me that the days of TOCO models are broken, existing models are broken. I started by suggesting that the only thing you'd be able to charge for in future was video, and the rest would be packaged in for free. But actually, you've gone further. You've now told me that actually the days of charging for Tarco are over, and that actually it's all going to be about financial services. Now, with that, what I want to do is take a deep breath, because I don't necessarily believe everything I've just said, and just say, OK, what I'd like to do now is just brainstorm what you really think about this. So, OK, deep breath. 30 seconds, just think. Is what I've said complete, start ravingly, loony, bonkers, mad? Or what do we think? Not just about the banking thing, but what do we think in general? What do you think? Gosh. Yeah, good point. OK, just, just hang just a moment. Just, just 30 seconds more, just, just 30 seconds more, just, to, just reflect for a moment. Okay, we've just got 15 minutes, and what we're going to do is a big brainstorm. Before I do anything, I just want to ask how you feel, not what you think. <laughs>